This program contains graphic recreations of violent battles. Viewer discretion is advised. In one of the most hostile lands on the planet, an ancient people called the Israelites forged an army and carved out an empire. Their ancient military exploits are described in one of history's most famous religious texts, the Old Testament of the Bible. But by reading between the religious lines, ancient military historians are able to unlock the soldiers' secrets of the Bible by examining the weapons, the strategies, and the commanders, including some unlikely warriors, like Abraham, Moses, and Deborah. In no other military history of the period are so many different and sophisticated tactical maneuvers shown to be militarily capable than is the study of Israelite military history. From a historical and especially a military historian's point of view, the Bible can serve as a handbook for warfare. Blood often flows more freely than holy water in the days of the Old Testament. And the military secrets of the Bible have yet to be revealed until now. It is around the 14th century BC in the southern part of modern day Israel. A force of about 300 soldiers searches for an army that has invaded the area and kidnapped several of the locals. One of the captives is a man named Lot. It is Lot's uncle who leads the rescue force, but he is no ordinary man. He is the father of the Israelites and is about to fight one of the first battles described in the Bible. His name is Abraham. One of the interesting things you find about studying battles of the Bible, in no other military history of the period are so many different and sophisticated tactical maneuvers demonstrated uh, and, and shown to be militarily capable than is the study of Israelite military history. And it all begins with Abraham and his rescue of Lot. Dr. Richard A. Gabriel is one of the world's preeminent experts on ancient military strategy and history. His experience as a platoon commander in Vietnam has led him to examine the Bible from a unique perspective, through the eyes of a soldier. Gabriel's military theories about the Old Testament are controversial. What I did is I stepped back and said, look at the battles of the Bible. From the perspective of a ground soldier like myself, of a combat soldier, of a, of a person who's been, been shot at and been frightened to death, just look at it from that perspective of the simple ground soldier and the military historian. Does the Bible make military sense? And the answer, I think, is without a doubt, it does. To understand Lot's capture, one need only look at a map of the Middle East. Modern-day Israel, or the land of Canaan, as it is known in ancient times, is a land bridge connecting Africa with Asia and Europe. Over the last 4,000 years, innumerable armies have crisscrossed this narrow strip of land, drenching its soil with blood. On this occasion, a coalition of Mesopotamian armies had traveled hundreds of miles from their home in modern-day Iraq to the Dead Sea area of Canaan. It is from the town of Sodom that Lot is kidnapped. The Mesopotamians are coming into the land of Canaan because they know of the vast amount of riches that pass through this land bridge, and they want their cut. And if the Canaanites aren't going to give it to them, then they're going to take it by force. Dr. Mark Schwartz specializes in the origins and development of ancient civilizations in the Middle East. His fieldwork in Israel and Turkey has led him to study the weapons and military strategy of these ancient societies. The Mesopotamians end up defeating a coalition of Canaanite kings around the Dead Sea area. They sack and loot towns uh, in the area, and they take slaves. But they may have gotten a little bit more than they bargained for by taking Lot captive because his uncle is Abraham. 
According to the Bible, Abraham is the first of the patriarchs of Judaism, the first of the Hebrews who believes in a single God, often called Yahweh. In the Bible, Yahweh promises the land of Canaan to Abraham's descendants. When most people think of Abraham, they think of an old Bedouin leading his flock around the desert. Most people do not think of a military leader, but it's quite evident from reading the Bible, especially the instance with the rescue of his nephew Lot, that Abraham was a very skilled military tactician. To better understand the father of the Israelites as a military commander, one may have to look outside of the Bible. Ancient cuneiform clay tablets discovered in Egypt, known as the Amarna letters, are believed to have been written around 1450 BC, about the same time Abraham is believed to have existed. They tell of a semi-nomadic people who are practiced in the art of warfare. These people are called Habiru, a term defined by modern scholars as wanderer or outcast. The Habiru were not an ethnic group at all. What they were was a class of wandering peoples. And they moved throughout the Middle East uh, into Canaan, for example, Mesopotamia, and in Egypt. They did, in fact, tend sheep, but they also tended gardens that gave them lettuce and cucumbers and melons, suggesting that they were agriculturalists. They were stonecutters, the Bibles tell us, along with witness, and they were soldiers. Every Habaru clan, if you like that term, had with it a military arm, and that military arm would be comprised of the best young soldiers in the group. The descriptions of the Habiru in ancient texts like the Amarna letters are extremely similar to the descriptions of Abraham and the ancient Hebrews of the Bible. Some scholars believe that the Hebrews and the Habiru warriors might be one and the same. Now, the Habiru Hebrew connection will probably never be proven definitively, and it's a hotly debated topic amongst anthropologists, biblical uh, archaeologists, and also linguists. Um, but the similarity of these two groups is quite striking, especially when you consider the military exploits of Abraham in the rescue of his nephew Lot. The task for Abraham will be difficult. The Mesopotamians are likely a wealthier people and wield some of the most advanced weapons of the day, like the bronze sickle sword. In 1990, Dr. Richard Gabriel conducted experiments with this ancient weapon. He discovered that a typical soldier could swing a three-foot-long, approximately two-pound sickle sword about 53 feet per second and generate about 77 foot-pounds of energy. If the soldier has the rare occasion of an open shop, it's enough force to lop an arm or a head off in one chop. The sickle sword could not kill by stabbing. It had to kill by hacking. So this often meant more than one chop. Archaeological evidence shows that the design and construction of the sickle sword evolves over time. As the period progresses, the sword is produced longer in length and with a greater curve. Now, we're not exactly sure why, but my guess is that ancient soldiers and smiths probably worked together to create the most efficient close combat weapon they could. The Mesopotamians also fight with the spear. Used overhand, the six-foot-long spear could be thrust at about 55 feet per second, generating enough force to drive the spear completely through the enemy's body. Used underhand, the speed decreases dramatically, accelerating at only about 24 feet per second. But underhand thrusting provides a good opportunity to strike the enemy's legs. The spear and the sickle sword are hand-to-hand -hand combat weapons, and the killing in ancient times is up close and personal. With the strike of the sword, you would see someone's face open up or body open up. You would hear the screams of terror, the sweat from his brow, the terror in his eyes. The bowels will let go. This is all very bloody business. It is this very business that awaits Abraham and his warriors. But unlike the Mesopotamians, Abraham's men are most likely armed only with spears and clubs. 
These disadvantages, however, do not deter the father of the Hebrews. Abraham sets the pattern for future Israelite military leaders by devising a guerrilla-style attack. The ancient Israelites' first military test of the Bible is about to unfold. The father of the Israelites, a man named Abraham, leads 300 men into battle against a much larger and likely better equipped Mesopotamian army. The goal is to free Israelite captives, including Abraham's nephew, Lot. Most armies of this time period fight during the day on the open battlefield with structured lines of attack. According to the Bible, Abraham's attack is a surprise nighttime raid from two different directions. Because of the surprise attack, the Mesopotamians have no time to form into defensive ranks. One of the first battles of the Bible is hand-to-hand -hand guerrilla warfare. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them. Despite the inferiority of their weapons and numbers, Abraham and his warriors emerge victoriously. Lot is rescued and returned home safely. In the Bible, it is God who promises that Abraham, that he shall be the father of nations. In fact, the pattern of, he, of Abraham as a military and political leader of a clan of Habiru is the same pattern we see persisting throughout the Old Testament in the future battles of the Bible. So in one sense, God kept his promise with a slight twist. Abraham did not only become the father of nations, he became the father of warriors. It is an Israelite warrior who becomes the hero of the next major Bible battle. His name is Moses, and the battle is known as the Exodus. Almost anyone who has read the Bible knows the history of the Exodus. It is a story of a people who were oppressed and enslaved and who escaped from their oppressors, fled across the desert, and survived by divine guidance. And this story is so common, it's been recorded in books and on films, and it's one that almost every schoolboy knows almost by heart. The trouble is, from a historical perspective, it's really quite false. The Egyptians ruthlessly imposed upon the Israelites the various labors that they made them perform. Ruthlessly, they made life bitter for them with harsh labor at mortar and bricks and with all sorts of tasks in the field. If you read the Bible's text in Hebrew, it uses the word avadim. Avadim is not the word for slave. The word for, it is the word for worker or even servants. The fact of the matter is, is that, e that the Israelites in Egypt were not slaves. The notion that the Israelites might not have been slaves in Egypt contradicts fundamental Judeo-Christian beliefs. But by examining the Exodus from a military perspective, new light may be shed on this historic journey. This is a tricky subject because outside the Bible, there's no definitive corroborating text that can either support or refute the fact that the Israelites were slaves. But if we ask the simple question, could a nation of mere slaves be able to go up against the mighty Egyptian army and survive? Logically, it doesn't seem like they could. Now, what if they weren't slaves? What if they actually were a group with military experience? Remember Abraham and some of his military exploits. Now a group of people leaving Egypt with a military arm puts a completely different spin on the story. To better understand the Exodus, one must travel back in time about 200 years to the land of Canaan. Here, Abraham and his Israelite descendants are forced to flee the land because of famine and drought. They migrate to the eastern edge of Egypt 
and settle in the land of Goshen, where the earth is fertile and flocks and crops thrive. But some scholars believe they are also in this area fighting as mercenary soldiers in the Egyptian army. Their job would be to serve as a first line of defense against invaders from the north. These Haviru were mercenaries. They were soldiers of fortune. They would fight for whoever it was in their best interest at that time uh, to fight for. And it seems that they had a, a good thing going in Egypt for a few hundred years. But eventually, a new pharaoh rises to power. Some scholars believe he is Seti I, and he does not seem to care much for the Israelites. And he said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them, so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. The sheer location of where the Habiru are in the land of Goshen, sitting astride the key route of invasion or defense of Egypt, probably convinced Seti himself, a professional warrior, that something had to be done to either remove them or to weaken their influence or at least remove them from their geographical area. Thus it is that Seti becomes, most historians think, the Pharaoh in the Bible who first sets the Israelites to physical labor. Many believe this physical labor amounts to slavery, but this may be an historical inaccuracy. While forced labor is practiced, some scholars believe that ownership of another person is rare at this time. There is no slavery in Egypt right from the beginning until the end of the empire. Well, if in fact they were not slaves set to labor, what were they? The answer is corvée labor. That is a term used to describe, essentially, conscripted civilian workers to work on public works projects. These people were not slaves. They were paid and they were well treated. We know that from the military medical text, which stations military doctors with the workmen in order to make sure that they are well treated and well fed. Whether slaves or not, the demotion from soldier to common physical worker probably signaled to the Israelites that it was time to leave Egypt. They had lost their status as noble allies. They were now being treated like common workers. It was time to go. So Moses says to Pharaoh, listen, God told me personally to lead my people out of here, so you've got to let my people go. But Pharaoh resists, then what follows is the Passover story and the plagues that wrought devastation upon Egypt. With the tenth and final plague, the killing of the firstborn, this culminates in the Pharaoh allowing the Israelites to leave Egypt. But the Bible says something very interesting right after this episode, something that actually makes us question whether they really, in fact, were slaves or not. Now the Israelites went up armed out of the land of Egypt. Very clear, of course, that slaves do not march out armed from their oppressors. So what we have is the military arm now is formed, as it had always been, to protect the rest of the Habiru clan as it begins to move out of Egypt and reach its homeland back in Canaan. Almost immediately, however, Pharaoh changes his mind and sets his army in pursuit of the Israelites. But it is unclear exactly why Pharaoh does this. The answer may be found in Exodus 12, verse 35. The Israelites had done Moses' bidding and borrowed from the Egyptians objects of silver, gold, and clothing. And the Lord had disposed the Egyptians favorably toward the people, and they let them have their request. Thus, they stripped the Egyptians. Well, it just stretches credibility to think that the Egyptians would have done such a thing, especially so when you read the text. The term that is used is nesayel in Hebrew, which means to despoil. What seems to have happened is the Israelites are fleeing Egypt. They are not equipped. 
To be in the desert, they need food, shelter, water, animals, and what they do is they take it. So the reason, I think one could argue, that changed Pharaoh's mind was news that the Israelites who were leaving had simply raided a town and sacked it and took all the supplies. And the text bears me out on this, for it says Pharaoh found that the Israelites were leaving Egypt boldly. Keep in mind, this is not just a bunch of, of nomads. This is a Habaru group of some size with a military arm and they use that military might to provision themselves in order to survive in the desert. In response to this possible attack, Pharaoh unleashes his army in pursuit. The hallmark of the Egyptian force is the horse-drawn war chariot. The Egyptian army was armed with the lightest and fastest and most maneuverable chariot in the world. The Egyptian chariot is drawn by two horses and usually carries a charioteer and an archer. The platform is fashioned in the shape of a D. The cab is about one yard tall and usually covered with stretched animal hide. The axle is placed at the far rear of the carrying platform, a development that increases the speed, stability and maneuverability of the vehicle. Armed with the composite bow, the archer could bring the enemy under fire from a distance away. As he closed with the enemy, aim shots were lethal. Made of wood, horn, and ox tendon, laminated together, the composite bow can outdistance and outpenetrate any other bow of the day. While conducting experiments with the composite bow, Dr. Gabriel discovered that its recurved shape helps the archer launch an arrow at a 30 to 35 degree angle, about 250 yards, or two and a half football fields, in about 5.8 seconds. Then he could dismount from the chariot and fight his infantry, and then finally, if the enemy broke, he'd get back on the chariot and chase them. So what happens? You have lethality and mobility introduced into warfare, which for 2,000 years before is basically infantry warfare. Nobody could move any faster than their feet could carry them. With the Egyptian chariot force in hot pursuit, the Israelites quickly leave the Nile Delta area. But now, Moses does something surprising. According to the Bible, he turns off the main road leading to Canaan and heads into the desert. One can only imagine what the young junior officers must have thought, and that was that Moses had lost his mind. Why would Moses do such a thing? While the move to lead the Israelites into the desert surprises many, it seems Moses has a plan. Some believe he is luring Pharaoh into a trap. A nighttime commando raid like Abraham's rescue of Lot is a classic military maneuver, one that is taught in military academies throughout the world. The modern Israeli Defense Force emulates this tactic on July 4th, 1976. 100 hostages are held by Palestinian and German terrorists at the Entebbe airport in Uganda. A surprise nighttime raid helps Israeli commandos rescue the hostages. This program contains graphic recreations of violent battles. Viewer discretion is advised. The Israelites have begun their great exodus out of Egypt and are marching toward the land of Canaan a land supposedly promised to them by God. With the Egyptian chariot force in hot pursuit, the Israelite military leader Moses turns off the main road to Canaan and leads his people into the desert. The Bible states that Moses had previously spent 40 years in this desert and like all good military commanders, has an intimate knowledge of the terrain. Some believe he knows exactly where he is and exactly where he is heading. And according to the Bible, God is leading the way. The Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel day and night. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that we read about in the Bible are what led the people through the desert. 
and it represented the fact that God's presence was always with them. Though the pillar of smoke and fire has religious significance, it can also be explained from a military perspective. Ancient Egyptian stone reliefs depict a scene in which Pharaoh Ramses is sitting in front of two soldiers, each of whom is holding up a large pole. On top of one of those poles is the hieroglyph for flame, and on top of the other is the hieroglyph for a closed brazier, which of course, if you put a cover on a brazier, you get smoke. Erected at the front of a marching column, the pillar of smoke and fire is a way for a military commander to communicate with the rest of his troops. So the pillar of smoke and pillar of, of fire is a very common, at least for the Egyptians, military mechanism for leading troops and pitching camp. At the end of the third day of marching, the Israelites make camp. That night, Pharaoh arrives and sees the pillar of fire directly in front of him. Pharaoh might believe he has the upper hand. Understanding that the pillar of fire always leads a group, it looks to him as though Moses has gotten himself turned around and is heading back to Egypt. The first rule of military tactics, always deceive your enemy as to your intentions. Moses is trying to deceive Pharaoh into thinking that he is lost in the desert. The placement of the pillar of fire seems to be integral to Moses' strategy of eluding the Egyptians, because on the other side of the Israelite army is the Sea of Reeds. Perhaps no event in the Book of Exodus, in fact, the entire Bible, has captured the imagination much like Moses parting the Sea of Reeds. I mean, who hasn't seen the Cecil B. DeMille classic with Charlton Heston raising his arms and parting the Sea of Reeds? It's an incredible moment. But I think if you look at it from a critical eye, especially the point of view of a military historian, what you see is that Moses is using an intimate knowledge of the terrain to defeat the Egyptian army without even raising a sword. Night falls upon the encampments, the pillar of smoke changes to a pillar of flame. And behind that pillar of flame is the escape route that Moses has planned. Now, anyone who's been a soldier understands at night, you never look into a bright light. If you look into a bright light, it affects your eyes for as much as 30 minutes. So here you have a situation of a bright light burning in front of the Egyptians. They can see the light, but they are blind to anything behind that light. At the same time in the midst of the night, the east wind begins to blow. An easterly wind mentioned in the Bible, likely quite loud, convinces Dr. Gabriel that the Egyptian soldiers on night watch might now be deaf as well as blind. It is at this point that Moses moves his people across the Sea of Reeds. Then Moses held out his arm over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind all that night, and turned the sea into dry ground. Some biblical historians believe the crossing of the Sea of Reeds occurs about 20 miles south of the Mediterranean Sea in an alluvial swamp, a swamp subject to tides. One explanation of this phenomenon is that the tide goes out making the swamp passable. The easterly wind is likely quickening the process. Very simply, what probably was an alluvial swamp of perhaps eight to 10 inches of water suddenly, over a period of 45, 50 minutes, becomes dry. And at that point, the Israelites, safely behind their bright light still blinding the Egyptians with the wind howling so they cannot hear, begin to withdraw across the Reed Sea. At dawn, Pharaoh discovers an abandoned camp. He immediately gives chase. But while the tide may be out, the ground is too soft to handle the weight of Pharaoh's chariots. At the morning watch, the Lord looked down upon the Egyptian army from a pillar of fire and cloud and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He locked the wheels of their chariots so that they moved forward with difficulty. Now, while stuck in this mud, probably the tide begins to come in, perhaps some people drown. 
But what is important is that tide's going to be in for almost eight hours now. There's no way for Pharaoh to pursue. Pharaoh would have to march two hours north to a crossing at a town called Migdal to continue the pursuit. By that time, he most likely would have lost the Israelite scent. So here you have a fine strategic and tactical commander making great use of his knowledge of the terrain that he had gathered uh, for his own life in that area. The Hebrews have eluded the Egyptians, but this is only one small step in the greater strategic plan. Moses wants to deliver his people to the Promised Land, the land of Canaan. But instead of heading north, which would put them perilously close to Egyptian forces, Moses heads south, eventually ending up at Mount Sinai. It is here where Moses supposedly receives the Ten Commandments from God. But it is also at Sinai where Moses institutes a military draft and trains a new generation of Israelite soldiers. The encampment for two years at Sinai is among the most momentous events of the Bible. For it is here that the Habaru become the beginning of the nation of Israel. It was at Sinai where the modern Israeli Defense Force was born. After two years, the Bible states that a well-trained and well-organized Israelite army marches out of Sinai in a column divided into several divisions. Scouts lead the way, followed by heavy infantry, spear and shield-bearing soldiers. They march and fight in phalanx, or several rows of tightly interlocked warriors. Next come light infantry soldiers. Armed with bronze sickle swords, they have the ability to quickly respond in all directions. Then come archers and slingers, equipped to launch arrows and rocks at the enemy. Finally, another line of heavy infantry soldiers defends the rear of the column. The Bible states that from Sinai, Moses leads the Israelite army to an oasis called Kadesh Barnea. Here, the text states they remain for another 40 years, increasing their military size and strength, preparing for the conquest of Canaan. But for all of Moses' military preparations, he dies before his people enter the Promised Land. It is an interesting thing when you think about how we know Moses. We almost always know him as a religious leader or as a prophet, uh, someone who talked to God, but we almost never think of him as a military leader. And yet, if you look at the Exodus as military history, it, bec it becomes very clear in one instance after another that Moses had a superb command of military tactics and strategies. The conquest of Canaan becomes the responsibility of the next great Israelite military commander, Joshua. And one of his first campaigns is the historic battle of Jericho. Perhaps one of the most difficult military maneuvers is a nighttime crossing of a body of water. Taking a page out of Moses' tactical manual, General Ariel Sharon leads an armored division across the Suez Canal in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Sharon's nighttime water crossing leads Israel to victory. The year is about 1240 BC. Two Israelite spies are on a mission of reconnaissance to evaluate the terrain and assess the state and strength of the armed forces of the city of Jericho. The Israelite conquest of Canaan is about to commence. The conquest of Canaan is one of the bloodiest episodes in the Bible. Here you have the Israelites moving into the land of Canaan that was supposedly promised to them by God. And of course, standing in their way are the people that live there, the Canaanites who have a flourishing civilization and are willing to defend the land to the death. Uh, this is a recipe for lots of bloodshed and it all begins at the walls of Jericho. Some believe the walls surrounding the city of Jericho at this time are about 30 feet high and 1,500 yards in circumference, 
enclosing an area of about eight and a half acres. The walls are known as casement walls, with an inner and an outer wall running parallel together. The Bible states that a prostitute named Rahab lives in an apartment between the walls. The Israelite spies infiltrate the city and befriend Rahab. She hides them under thatching on the roof, then supplies them with critical information. Rahab informs them that the people of Jericho are terrified. They have heard of the deadly Israelite army cutting a swath of destruction on their way to the land of Canaan. About a year earlier, the Israelites had left the desert oasis of Kadesh Barnea and began to march toward the land of Canaan with one goal in mind, to conquer. King Sihon, with all his men, took the field against us at Jehaz, and the Lord our God delivered him to us, and we defeated him and his sons and all his men. And we dealt them such a blow that no survivor was left. We doomed every town, men, women, and children. This is the force Rahab the prostitute and the people of Jericho have heard about. This is the force they fear. The Israelite spies have the information they need. Rahab helps them escape from the fortress. The spies tell Rahab to keep a crimson cord in the window so the invading Israelite soldiers know not to kill her or any in her house. The spies report back to the Israelite command post across the Jordan River in the town of Shittim. Here, the new Israelite commander readies his troops. His name is Joshua. Joshua was born to be a great military leader. He's one of the few remaining Israelites from the Exodus. He was Moses' number two guy wandering around the Sinai during this period. He fought battles in the Sinai alongside Moses. So he definitely has the military prowess to conquer Canaan. After hearing the reconnaissance report, Joshua moves the Israelite force across the Jordan River and camps at a town called Gilgal. This will be Joshua's main logistics base, complete with a weapons manufacturing plant. The conquest of Canaan occurs at the end of a period of time known as the Bronze Age, a time when ancient metallurgists had mastered the skill required to turn copper-laden rock into deadly metal weapons. The process of converting ore to metal is extremely difficult and extremely exciting. I can't imagine the difficulties that went on for the metalsmiths at the time, because even today we can't replicate exactly what they did. The process begins by crushing copper ore. This will make it easier to remove impurities and obtain as pure a specimen of copper as possible. Once you've actually crushed the rock, you're then in a position to try to reduce it or remove the impure elements and get down to pure copper. And that's when the fun starts, because that's when fire gets involved. The crushed copper ore is heated inside this clay shaft furnace. A typical fire reaches about 900 degrees Celsius. But the ancient metallurgists need to create an even hotter fire. Inside the furnace, the fire would get very hot with the aid of bellows. So what you're doing is blowing air with the bellows made of goat skin or goat stomachs, forcing air into the fire and actually increasing the temperature to get it above 1200 degrees Celsius. Ancient metalsmiths used charcoal as a fuel because it helps remove the oxygen from the copper ore, reducing it to pure metallic copper. As the ore reduces, the copper minerals emit a mesmerizing green flame. This is the visual clue to the metallurgists that the copper ore is smelting or becoming molten copper. It often takes several hours to get to this stage. Once the copper has been smelted, it is placed in a crucible inside the furnace and remelted. Now, the next ingredient in creating bronze is added, tin. Tin strengthens the metal and improves fluidity to make for easier casting into a deadly weapon. 
The catch, of course, is that whereas copper is plentiful throughout the Middle East, tin is much rarer. Uh, evidence suggests possible sources in Turkey, maybe some sources in Afghanistan. Once the copper tin alloy is melted, the smiths pour the molten metal into a mold made of clay, sand, or rock. Creating these deadly weapons is a precise science of which ancient metallurgists were masters. Hundreds of furnaces likely litter the landscape of Gilgal, supplying Joshua with the weapons he needs to conquer Canaan. Fully armed, Joshua launches his invasion. Biblical scholars disagree as to exactly why Joshua chooses Jericho first. Dr. Richard Gabriel believes it is because Jericho is a soft military target. The choice of Jericho is simply this. He wants to blood the army. He wants the army to have a first victory. Nothing so excites an army than the fact that it wins. And secondly, he has no intention of taking Jericho. Okay, This is not a strategic war of armies. This is a war of extermination. Joshua intends to destroy every town he can and its population in order to repopulate it with Israelites. And so there's a psychology here. One, you destroy that town and kill everything in it. And that will send a message to any other town in the land of Canaan that if you want to survive, you can't even surrender. You got to leave. The Bible states that God formulates a plan for Joshua to conquer Jericho. But this divine scheme makes no mention of the more typical methods of the time used to defeat a walled city, like climbing scaling ladders or using battering rams. Instead, God merely tells Joshua, Let all your troops march around the city and complete one circuit of the city. Do this for six days, with seven priests carrying seven ram's horns, preceding the ark. Why did every day Joshua get the army up, march towards the wall, and essentially what we used to call demonstrate in front of the walls? The answer is probably Rahab the prostitute. So as the Israelite spies leave Rahab's house, they instruct her to hang a crimson cord outside her window on the outside of the wall as a mark to the other Israelites not to harm or kill anyone in that house. If you think about it, it doesn't make too much sense because if the Israelites successfully besiege the city and enter the inside of the city through the streets going from house to house, they're not gonna see this crimson cord hanging outside the city walls. So what if the crimson cord is not a signal saying, don't kill us, we're the good guys. What if it's actually saying, psst, over here, come on up, we're the good guys. Dr. Gabriel believes the rope the spies used to escape Jericho might now be used to infiltrate the city. Imagine this. Every day for six days, Joshua demonstrates outside the city. Why would he do that? The answer is a diversion. While everyone is scared to death watching the army, three and four men are very silently climbing up the rope into Rahab's apartment, after six days, it would easily be possible to insinuate somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to 40 special operations troops in Rahab's apartment and on the roof. On the seventh day, Joshua's troops blow the shofar one last time. Long throughout military history, Horns, bugles, and noisemakers have been used in battle as a psychological weapon to intimidate foes. But they are also used to signal allies. At Jericho, Joshua could be trying to accomplish both. And when a long blast is sounded on the horn, as soon as you hear that sound of the horn, all the people shall give a mighty shout. Thereupon the city wall will collapse, and the people shall advance, every man straight ahead. According to Dr. Gabriel's theory, this mighty shout might actually be a signal to the troops inside to commence their attack. At which point the special ops guys emerged from their hiding places, overpowered the guards, and threw open the gate, 
and the walls came tumbling down, which is only a metaphor for saying, essentially, that the city defenses collapsed. The metaphorical explanation hides a very pragmatic and very sophisticated use of intelligence, special ops troops, as well as major forces to take the city, not by storm, but by rust. Essentially trick them. Once the walls are breached, the wholesale slaughter begins. The use of noise as a psychological weapon is emulated through the ages. During World War II, the Germans designed their Stuka dive bombers to make a horrifying shriek on their descent. Some American tank commanders in the first Gulf War were reported to be blasting heavy metal music to intimidate the Iraqis. Today's military forces are experimenting with the use of high-frequency sound waves to cause nausea and disorient an enemy. This program contains graphic recreations of violent battles. Viewer discretion is advised. Joshua and his Israelite army have breached the walls of Jericho. Now, the bloodshed begins. One further proof of the professionalism of the Israelite army is that it could kill on command. When Joshua put a town under the harem, which is the ban, okay, what does the text tell us? To go up among the town and leave nothing that breathes alive. Literally nothing. They killed every human, they killed every baby, they killed every cow, every jackass, every donkey, and every horse. For an army to do that, that's a highly disciplined army and a highly cohesive army. They exterminated everything in the city with the sword, man and woman, young and old. The violence that occurs in the Bible, uh, in fact, occurs in many other historical texts. The slaughter of children, the extermination of whole peoples, uh, the beheading of people, all of that occurred in other cultures uh, at the time. Now, how does one reconcile that with the idea that some people use the Bible as a guide to their life? Um, well, one would either have to admit that history is wrong, and I don't think it is, or that uh, God is a savage creature in that uh, the instruction of the Bible is certainly full of enough violence to give rise to the question of what kind of a God, if there is one, would per permit this. the Israelites burned Jericho to the ground. After this first victory, the Bible states they retired to their logistics base at Gilgal. Upon their return, the warriors who shed blood are forced to wait outside the camp for seven days and cleanse themselves. He who touches the corpse of any human being shall be unclean for seven days. He shall cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, and then be clean. But these seven days may not only be for physical cleansing, they may also be for psychological healing as well. What we know about the psychology of killing, it isn't so much the fear of being killed that drives human beings crazy. It's the killing. Killing another human being has an enormously traumatic impact. So using this analysis, you might conclude very well that soldiers in ancient armies were in many, many cases psychiatric cases, uh, walking psychiatric cases all the time. Uh, why? Because uh, they killed and killed up close and personal and there wasn't any doubt. It wasn't like pulling a trigger. They, they, they knew that, uh, that, that they killed. Uh, it is the terrible cost of war. The Israelite soldiers do not get much rest or recuperation after Jericho, for the next step in conquering Canaan is at hand. Joshua wants to gain a foothold in the mountains. 
Running down the middle of Canaan is a central mountain ridge. Because of this natural obstacle, the easiest lines of advance for any military force are through the valleys. But Joshua's force is mostly a light infantry force with no chariots. They fight predominantly with sickle swords and spears and usually wear leather armor. Attempting to conquer Canaan by way of the valleys would be disastrous for the Israelites as the Canaanite chariot forces would easily overpower them. So Joshua seeks to gain control of the mountains, then attack the country from the high ground. Joshua's invasion begins at the Battle of Ai. Here he destroys a people known as the Bethelites. Then Joshua burned down Ai and turned it into a desolation to this day. And the king of Ai was impaled on a stake until the evening. The psychological effects of the defeat at the Balvi reverberate throughout the country. I mean, if the Canaanites weren't scared before, they definitely are taking notice now. But this has an unintended consequence for Joshua because the city-states of Canaan start to band together. They start to form a unified front against the Israelites. The Bible states that Joshua then forges a military alliance with Canaanites living in the town of Gibeon. Gibeon sits astride a key crossroad on the central mountain ridge of Canaan. It is a strategic target that the Canaanites in the area will do everything in their power to prevent Joshua from controlling. He signs a treaty with the town of Gibeon. That is what provokes the formation of a rival Canaanite coalition. And the time comes very shortly when they meet in battle at one of the most famous battles of the Bible, the Battle of the Ailan Valley. Five kings from southern Canaan join together and attack Joshua's new allies in Gibeon. When Joshua hears of the attack, he immediately musters his troops. He moves his army from Gilgal, which is 20 miles away, and moves it throughout the night in a very difficult climb of 3,000 feet up the east ridge of the Jerusalem mountains in order to position himself around the town of Gibeon before daylight breaks. Gibeon is located on a small rise in a valley. The Canaanite coalition troops are encamped in the valley. Joshua positions his army uphill and due east of the Canaanite camp. He seems to have chosen this location purposefully, for another ally will soon join him. The sun. Joshua waits for the sun to rise. And the sun comes up from the east. It is shining right in the eyes of the Canaanites. This gave him a significant advantage because he was attacking downhill. If you move your eyes up to try to see what's happening, you're looking right into the sun. And screaming down the hills comes the army of Joshua and smashes into the bivouacked army, half asleep army, unprepared army, and unfed army of the Canaanites, taking it completely by surprise, breaking its morale, and forcing it into an immediate flight. The Israelites chase the Canaanites from the town of Gibeon down the Ailan Valley. Joshua took them by surprise, marching all night from Gilgal. The Lord threw them into a panic before Israel. Eventually, Joshua executes all five Canaanite kings. It's one of the greatest victories of Joshua in the Bible, and indeed one of the campaigns that studied uh, for many, many years in almost all armies of the world. Because what you have here is an Israelite army having moved almost 30 miles in 48 hours, two-thirds of the time under combat condition. That's a military feat that modern commanders uh, would find very, very difficult uh, to achieve themselves. With this victory, Joshua has gained control of the southern part of the central mountain ridge. The Bible states that Joshua continues his attack on the rest of the country and eventually defeats 31 Canaanite city-states. But before Joshua can conquer the entire land of Canaan, he dies of old age. 
The battle for the Promised Land, however, continues. The next hero of the Bible is about to emerge and fight an historic battle against marauders from the desert. His name is Gideon. As Joshua seemed to understand, something as simple as the sun can mean the difference between victory or defeat. The ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu advised to attack with the sun behind one's army. In World War I, Allied fighter pilots had a saying to remind them of the importance the sun can play in battle. Beware the Hun in the sun. It is a dark time for the ancient Israelites. The year is around 1100 BC, and the Hebrews are leaderless and often victimized. The Bible calls this tumultuous time the period of the judges. The period of the judges is kind of like the Wild West. It's, it's a lawless time where local disputes are settled by, by local heroes, and the Israelites really are living at the whim of other peoples. They haven't gotten rid of the Canaanites, the Canaanites are still there, as well as invading peoples from the outside. Out of the Arabian desert comes a fierce nomadic warrior tribe called the Midianites. The Bible states that for seven years they wreak havoc upon the Israelites. To answer the Midianite threat, a tribal military commander, or judge, rises up to save the Israelites. His name is Gideon. Gideon is from the tribe of Manasseh. During the period of the judges, the Israelites spread throughout Canaan and live amongst their own tribes in separate territories. But there is little cooperation between the tribes, and Gideon's call to arms is answered only by his neighbors along the Jizreel Valley. While these troops march to rendezvous at Mount Gilboa, Gideon trains the warriors from his tribe. From his own tribe, he's able to raise a force of about 600 men. And the Bible is very interesting, uh, why it, what it tells us about the thinking of Gideon. Gideon looks at his 600 soldiers and says, too many soldiers. Gideon has developed a strategy using a smaller, more mobile force against the Midianites, whose numbers are believed to be in the thousands. He chooses only 300 elite soldiers, some of history's first known commandos. These 300 men he selected as a kind of special operations force to put into effect his tactical plan to deal with the Midianites. Gideon marches his commando force across the Jezreel Valley to the Midianite camp. The commandos carry torches, clay pots, as well as shofars, ram's horns that are like modern-day bugles. The Bible states that at midnight, Gideon breaks his force of 300 into three companies and encircles the Midianite camp on three sides, leaving the southernmost open. So what does Gideon do? He assembles his force, giving them the instructions, keep your eye on me and do as I do. And the three columns blew their horns and broke their jars. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and Gideon. Torches are seen by the Midianites who, in a panic, flee. And they're not sure how many people are coming and who is coming and where these lights are coming from. The Midianites are blinded. They start fighting themselves. It must have been complete 
pandemonium. Gideon and his force engage the enemy, but mostly they drive the Midianites down the Jezreel Valley toward the Jordan River. This is where Gideon's tactical brilliance shines. The midnight attack seems to have just been a setup. Waiting in ambush for the Midianites are the rest of the tribal militia soldiers who had responded to Gideon's original call to arms. 3,000 tribal Israelite soldiers poured off the western edge of Mount Gilboa and struck the, the Midianite forces in the flank and slaughtered them. The tribal militia groups retire from the battle, believing that the Midianites have been soundly defeated. But Gideon is not yet satisfied. The Midianite kings have escaped. What happens is the militia commanders take their militias and return home. And Gideon takes his 300 special ops forces, this elite group, crosses the Jordan, and as the Bible tells us, Gideon and his men went on the prowl. Gideon's relentless pursuit might be fueled by revenge. Gideon's brothers had earlier been killed, likely by the Midianite kings. Finally, Gideon captures his enemies. Those men you killed at Tabor, what were they like? They looked just like you, they replied, like sons of a king. They were my brothers, he declared, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had spared them, I would not kill you. What had happened is the Midianites had captured some of Gideon's men, apparently his brothers, and killed them. If that's what the text is telling us, now, kind of like Michael Corleone in The Godfather, this is no longer just business. This is personal. This is a typical Canaanite, Israelite, Arabic blood feud. The kings of the Midianites have killed his brothers. Jo uh, Gideon demands revenge. Gideon calls upon his teenage son to extinguish the king's life. This is really humiliating. To be killed by a boy who's not of proper military age is a very dishonorable way to die. And on top of that, they're gonna be killed by someone who doesn't have experience with this. It's not gonna be a clean, painless death. But the boy did not draw his sword, for he was timid, being still a boy. Ah! Never again do the Midianites enter Canaan and attack the Israelites. The Bible states that Gideon returns home and lives a long, peaceful life. But life in this area of ancient Israel will bear witness yet again to the horrors of war as enemy forces attempt to subdue the Israelites. This time, the force is one of the most powerful. They are the Philistines. British military officer Ord Wingate is said to have never been without his revolver, his whiskey flask, or his Bible. While fighting against Mussolini's army in North Africa during World War II, Wingate is inspired by the story of Gideon. He creates a smaller, more highly trained force to defeat his enemy. Wingate calls his commandos the Gideon Force. This program contains graphic recreations of violent battles. Viewer discretion is advised. They are known as the Philistines. A sea people, likely from the Aegean, 
they sweep down the Mediterranean and settle along the southern coastal plain of Canaan. These fierce warriors aim to control the ports of the Mediterranean Sea, as well as the trade routes throughout Canaan, including the often sought after Jezreel Valley. It is over access to this strategic pass that likely sets up an historic Bible battle. This time, the Israelite savior is an unlikely hero. Her name is Deborah. Deborah is considered to be the Joan of Arc of her people. She's a prophetess and she doles out advice, but she's also an astute military commander. And we can see this from the strategy that she chooses at this battle. Now this battle has a little bit of everything. It has double agents, it has assassinations, and it also has the brilliant use of terrain for military purposes. The Bible states that this historic battle is precipitated by a Canaanite king and his army commander, Sisera, who has been terrorizing the local Israelites. Some scholars believe that Sisera is actually a Philistine. Faced with a potentially threatening combination of Canaanite and Philistine forces, Deborah makes the critical decision to go to war. And as usual, during the time of the judges, most of the tribes proved to be unreliable. Only four tribes come forth, producing a force of between six and 8,000 men. Now, she is the main strategist, but her tactical commander, her field general, is Barak. The Bible states that Deborah orders Barak to march the Israelite soldiers to the top of Mount Tabor, which is located on the north side of the Jezreel Valley. Now, the choice of Mount Tabor is brilliant because it's up high, and from that position, Barak can see any army approaching from any direction. Secondly, it's very steep, which means that the Canaanite armies or Philistine armies, which essentially use chariots as their combat arm of decision, will be unable to climb or maneuver. The Philistine Chariot Corps is one of the deadliest in the ancient Middle East. Both charioteer and archer wear expensive bronze scale armor. The scales are overlapped, much like that of a fish, and they're about two millimeters thick. Quite effective. They would stop arrows, for example. They would stop the sword. The Philistine archer is armed with a composite bow that has a maximum range of nearly 300 yards, or three football fields. If you do not have chariots, you do not want to meet another army with chariots on the open plain. You will be decimated. What you want to do is try to choose a terrain that will slow down or even better, stop these chariots. And this is what the Israelites are trying to do by choosing Mount Tabor as the battlefield. The key now is to lure Sisera to the battlefield of choice. Deborah sends a double agent named Heber to inform Sisera of the Israelite army's location. Sisera immediately orders his army to march to Mount Tabor. Sisera's force is now likely armed with the bronze straight sword and the round shield. The round shield is smaller than the typical Canaanite rectangular shield, allowing the soldier more mobility. Like the sickle sword, soldiers could hack with the straight sword but now they have the advantage of being able to thrust the sword into the enemy. But even with these technological advances, the Philistine general Sisera makes a strategic mistake here. It is springtime in the Jezreel Valley. At the base of Mount Tabor runs the Wadi Kishan, or the Kishan River. Plus there's a whole range of other small drainage creeks. What Barak knows is at this time of year, the area on which the enemy army will have to maneuver with its heavy 450-pound chariots right, is a quagmire. Now, Barak strikes. <laughs> Barak has the advantage in two ways. One, he's attacking downhill. Secondly, he's attacking with light infantry. His people can move around in the mud a lot quicker than heavy infantry can, and of course, the charioteers themselves can't move at all. You put it all together and what you have is a highly mobile, well-motivated, well-led Israelite force, okay, prancing through the mud, easily outmaneuvering and overwhelming the Canaanite or Philistine force. Unlike most of his army, Sisera escapes, abandoning his troops to their fate. No, no. 
Out of the muck, he finds refuge with a woman named Jael. He said to her, Stand at the entrance of the tent. If anybody comes and asks you if there is anybody here, say no. But Jael is no friend to the Philistine. When he was fast asleep from exhaustion, she approached him stealthily and drove the tent pin through his temple till it went through to the ground. Jael is the wife of Heber, the double agent who helped lure Sisera to Mount Tabor. Deborah and Barack's military brilliance really shines through that day. I mean, they did everything right. They used military intelligence, they used the right spies, they chose the right terrain, and it was a great, great victory. But they may not have been thinking in terms of the overall big picture. When looked at in the larger strategic context of the situation between the Israelites and the Philistines, Deborah's victory at the Kishon River was a, a strategic catastrophe. And uh, try to look at Deborah's victory from the perspective of a Philistine intelligence officer. They see for the first time in a hundred years, for the first time since Joshua, you have a contiguous area of control under the influence of Israelite tribes that runs through the entire Jezreel Valley almost to the coast. Controlling this area amounts to an enormous shift in the strategic equation against the Philistines. It is a shift that would not be allowed to stand, and the Philistine force moves very quickly to reverse it. During World War II, at the Battle of Alim Halfa in North Africa, British General Bernard Montgomery defeats German armored divisions, much like Deborah defeats Sisera's chariot corps. Allowing false maps to fall into enemy hands, Montgomery draws the German tanks onto inhospitable terrain. Unable to maneuver, the armored divisions are pummeled. Deborah's battle at Mount Tabor against the Canaanite Philistine coalition had been a great victory for the Israelites. But with this success comes a lethal price. The important Jezreel Valley trade routes have been cut off from the Philistines. This results in a shift in the strategic geomilitary equation of the area. The Philistine war machine is about to be awakened. The Philistines reacted to the shift in the strategic equation exactly how you'd expect them to react, and that is very quickly and with overwhelming military force. The Philistines destroy an Israelite army on the battlefield near the towns of Afek and Ebenezer. With momentum from this victory, the Philistines take back command of the coveted Jezreel Valley. They then punish the Israelites even further, taking control of the central mountain ridge. The result of the defeat at Afak was 50 years of military occupation by the Philistines on the central Israelite mountain spine that had been the land that Joshua had, con had conquered. It is more apparent than ever that the Israelites need one leader, a ruler who will unite the tribes against the common enemy, a king. That man would be Saul. Saul is one of the most successful military commanders in the Bible. He proves himself to be a fierce warrior and a supreme tactician. And more importantly, he's someone who can actually bring the tribes together and unify them to fight a common foe. Over a period of about 20 years, Saul builds a professional army and extends the Israelite kingdom with defeats over the Edomites, Moabites, and the Malachites. As the Israelite army increases in size and strength, however, the Philistines grow wary. 
The Philistine intelligence officers have been keeping their eye on, on Saul. He's no longer a young man and untested. He's now a battle-hardened captain who's won many victories uh, against tribal uh, rivals. And he has also now produced both a militia levy of about 12 to 14,000 men, as well as a permanent corps of about 3,000 mighty men or gibberine. This leads the Philistines to suspect that something has to be done about Saul sooner or later. It is Saul's son, Jonathan, who ignites the spark of war. While there is no motive offered in the Bible, Jonathan attacks a Philistine officer. This is the beginning of a bloody four-year war between the Israelites and the Philistines. In response to the assassination, the Philistines quickly advance a force to the town of Michmash. The armies face off near a ravine known as Michmash Pass. According to the Bible, the Israelite force is divided into two units. Jonathan commands about 1,000 troops at one end of the ravine. Saul leads a force of about 3,000 on the ridge. Camped at the other end of the ravine is the Philistine army. Apparently, these armies faced each other for several days. Eventually, a small Philistine force, not exactly sure of the size, tries to push its way up through the ravine to gain the heights above Mikmash Pass. It is during this Philistine advance that Jonathan decides to take matters into his own hands. The Bible states that Jonathan and his weapons bearer discover a secret pass through the ravine. They then approach the rear of the Philistine army and attack. At this point, it is likely that the Israelites have been influenced by the military technology of the Philistine fighting force. While the spear is still heavily utilized, Jonathan and his sword bearer would likely fight with the straight sword instead of the sickle sword. The round shield likely replaces the rectangular shield. In ancient societies, the weapons bearer is not just a ceremonial figure. He is a warrior, a trusted companion, and a personal bodyguard of sorts. He usually serves a king, or in Jonathan's case, a prince. It says in the Bible that Jonathan and his sword bearer killed 20 Philistines. But what seems to have happened is that they set off a chain reaction of fear, whereby the Philistines believe they are being attacked by a larger force from their rear flank. At this point, Saul unleashes his force into the ravine and attacks the Philistines. But now, if you can kind of imagine, two sizable groups of men, perhaps 6,000 in total, 3,000 or so on each side, are, are squashed in between a very narrow combat box. And, and it's hand-to-hand -hand fighting all the way. The advantage, of course, lays with uh, Saul and the Israelites. Why? They're light infantry. Light infantry relies on speed and mobility. The Philistines are heavy infantry. Their spearmen would try to form into phalanx, or a tightly interlocked square of several rows of soldiers. But on this terrain, the phalanx falls apart. Their inability to form into phalanx leaves them almost defenseless. A spearman, with all that heavy equipment standing out on the ground, like trying to swat a light infantry thought. So at the end of the day, what happened was is a significant defeat uh, on the part of the Philistines inflicted by Saul. Saul wins the day and chases the Philistines off the central mountain ridge. It is a decisive and strategic victory for the Israelites. But the Philistines will have their revenge. In 1917, as World War I engulfs the Middle East, the 
British army prepares to face off against the Ottoman Turks near the town of Mihmash. A British major recognizes the town's name, and by candlelight, he searches through his worn copy of the Bible. There, in the first book of Samuel, he finds the name Mikmash, along with the story of Jonathan and his sword bearer's attack on the Philistines. The British discover the same pass that Jonathan used, copy his strategy, and emerge from the battle victoriously. This program contains graphic recreations of violent battles. Viewer discretion is advised. Around the year 1010 BC, the Israelite army scores a major victory by defeating the Philistines at Michmas Pass. The Israelite King Saul is regarded as a hero. His popularity soars as he is able to take back control of the central mountain ridge of Canaan. This is a great time for Saul. He's secured the mountain ridge, he's cut the trade routes in the Jezreel Valley, and he's made headway to creating a united monarchy. But he can't hold off the Philistines for long, and eventually they come back with a vengeance. Since the defeat at Michmash Pass, the Philistines have attempted numerous frontal assaults through the valleys, trying in vain to gain back the central mountain ridge. They eventually decide to outflank the Israelites and attack from Mount Gilboa in the Jezreel Valley. The Philistine force camps at the base of Mount Moreh. Saul and the Israelites are camped on the heights of Mount Gilboa, overlooking the Jezreel. Saul seems to have the advantage, for he controls the high ground and the terrain is steep enough to prevent chariot attacks. The Philistines march across the plain. Leading the way is the heavy infantry phalanx. The Israelites wait until the Philistines are about one-third of the way up Mount Gilboa. Then they engage. The fighting is fierce. The Israelites hold their own despite a multi-pronged Philistine attack. The heavy phalanx infantry is pressing Saul on three sides, and that's deliberate. The Philistine pressure is fierce. It's designed to pinch and press the Saul, Saul's force tight against the mountain so they cannot maneuver. Just when it looks like Saul's army is going to be able to withstand the Philistine invasion, tragedy strikes. Saul is hit by Philistine archers who have gained the high ground. One possibility of how this might have happened is that as the infantry battle rages, a chariot force makes a wide flanking maneuver through the village of Gina, or modern day Jenin. Here, Mount Gilboa is not so steep. It's almost perfect chariot country. And there they are above Saul, not only cutting off his retreat, but firing down upon him. The Philistines attacked Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and many fell on Mount Gilboa. The battle raged around Saul, and some of the archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. The Philistines pursued Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan. struck several times and he's dying. Saul is dying. And he turns to his weapons bearer and says, kill me. I don't want to fall into the hands of the uncircumcised, as he said. I don't want to be made a public spectacle. But his uh, weapons bearer just can't do it, cannot kill his friend. Saul's final act in the Bible is heroic. 
The defeat at Geboa is a massive strategic defeat for the Israelites. The Philistines have regained the trade route in the Jezreel Valley. And for Saul and Jonathan, it's a tragic defeat for these two great Israelite commanders. With all of the progress made in conquering the land of Canaan, the Philistines have once again gained the upper hand. It seems the Israelite fate is sealed. But one man's destiny assures that the Israelites will eventually conquer the land of Canaan. He will succeed Saul as king and create the Israelite empire. His name is David. And one of his first appearances in the Bible occurs before King Saul is killed. It is one of the most well-known stories of the Old Testament. According to the Bible, the Israelites and the Philistines face off against each other near the Valley of Terebinth. The army commanders decide to settle the day by pitting each army's greatest fighter against each other. Now, that strikes the modern ear as strange. The idea very often was that it was the deities that actually decided battle. So it would come out the way the gods wanted it to come out. The Philistine champion is a giant known as Goliath. His challenge to the Israelites goes unheeded for days. Finally, David accepts the challenge. The Philistine said to David, Come here, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. David replied to the Philistine, This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will kill you and cut off your head, and I will give the carcasses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. Now there is some debate as to how old David was when he faced off with Goliath. The popular notion is that David was a boy. But from a military historian's point of view, looking at the text, it seems likely that David was of military age, probably around 20 or so. This is likely because of David's proficiency with the sling. Usually made of rope attached to a leather pouch, the sling is one of the most portable and least expensive weapons of the ancient world. The sling is not only the peasant's weapon, but it was a very common weapon among Israelite militia. It's capable of lobbing a tennis, uh, a tennis ball sized rock 300 yards, and it was used as a weapon of indirect fire in the same way the bow was. But David and Goliath are believed to be only about 30 feet apart. At this distance, the sling is more of a direct fire weapon, accelerating at about 120 feet per second capable of driving a four-ounce rock two inches into Goliath's eye socket with 16 foot-pounds of energy. Despite this massive Philistine warrior arrayed in battle armor, David simply slays him with a single slingshot to the skull. David approaches uh, Goliath, takes his kidon, his sickle sword, and chops off the giant's head. One imagines, although the text is silent, him holding up the, sword, the, the head of Goliath, uh, not only towards the Philistines, but holding it as a trophy uh, in, front of, in front of his own men. This feat attributed to David becomes legendary, and he stands on the precipice of greatness. In a few short years, he will become king conquer the Philistines, and take control of the central mountain ridge of the country. Ultimately, he will fulfill the promise supposedly made to the Israelites by God to conquer the land of Canaan. David follows in the footsteps of great Israelite military commanders whose expertise in devising strategies 
like special force operations and nighttime commando raids, are described in what some believe to be only a religious text. But to others, the Bible can be used as a guidebook to military strategy. In an overview of the battles of the Bible, what you have is a kind of political military saga of a people from its birth until its emergence in history uh, as an intact people with its own institutions, its own religion, its own armies. It's a fantastic journey that goes from uh, people leaving Egypt uh, to now have created not only the promised land, which was given to them by Yahweh, have created an empire that nobody gave them, but which they created by force of arms. Finally, after nearly 500 years of bloody and often devastating Bible battles, the Israelite empire is about to be born. <laughs>